First of all, let's uh, go ahead and correct something we forgot about last episode until the very end. So, we never introduced ourselves, the brilliant hosts of the Cacistocracy podcast. We are also a Cacistocracy, that's why we forgot to actually introduce ourselves. So, I am Paul. I am the person who's talking right now. And I am Billy. I'm the person who's talking right now. We're all very creative with uh, how we describe ourselves. Absolutely. What's up, guys? It's your boys, the famous and talented Willy Wanker, and I'm here as emotional support on this history podcast. Thank you. Did I do? Do you want me to do another one of those? I can do another one of those. (laughs) Do you want to be known as Willy Wanker on here? Do you want to be Dylan? Do you have a preference? Jeez. Yeah, that's fine. Either or. I've been called worse. By better. Um, you know, dude, El Duderito, if you're not in the whole brevity thing. A, a nacho cheese Duderito? Yeah, I'm I'm Dylan. I'm Dill Pickle. I'm, uh, uh... Literally know. no one calls you Dill Pickle. I've my never mo- heard My that. mommy does. The Bullies. fans... The Bullies fans of our it. podcast win I'm, that. I'm, uh, Hell or, yeah. or Big D in the kids' table. Um, or uh, Dylon, wasn't... Dylon, Dylon, and Dylon. Big D in the kids' table wasn't you. You're getting your life confused with John Rambo again. <laughs> no, that was... I had the ska band. <laughs> I just woke up to learn I left my favorite hat at the club hat. Last night, which sickened me real, real, real bad, because I had that hat since real, real small. <laughs> and we just got, we <laughs> just got copyright struck. And then my main stroke. squeeze, my main <laughs> yeah. squeeze went through my phone. Uh, so I guess I'm single now. You know, that I, that literally was... happened to me. I always wonder that, like, with making YouTube videos, like if I put like some punk music in there, right? Like they're signed to a label, but their whole ethos is anti-labels and shit right like Mm -hmm. am i gonna get copyright striked because that would be really funny for it's like anti-establishment music but like you can't use it (laughs) without our permission it's like my property man (laughs) yeah like you know property is bad but like don't use it the way copy the way copyright claims on youtube work now you can literally it's it's Somebody can have, like, a sub-company that leases rights from uh, the real company that makes a claim, you know. Companies will just make claims just to make well, them. Well, that's the sub-company. What about the Dom company? But, oh. <laughs> Whether or not this is going to be Creative Commons is something I guess we'll have to decide at some point. I don't care I that don't see much. The point. I don't see the point in copywriting a podcast. Yeah. Let's get on with the show. So the show is called Cacistocracy. Yeah, Cacistocracy, Cacist- which at least we did remember to explain what that means last time. Yes. Um, so yeah, yeah. Cacistocracy, for those of you who are new here, uh, which would be all of you because this is episode two. Um, I'm new here too. Cacistocracy is a government run by the like most incompetent or least qualified or least fit individuals in a state and that was just a great title for a podcast in which we explore just hilarious and incompetent and silly government decisions and leadership throughout history so that is the point of this show we uh we laugh we hopefully learn something stupid and that's pretty much how it goes Wait, now you said that we are a cacistocracy. Well, I just meant because we were kind of incompetent last time and that we forgot to introduce well, ourselves. I mean, all oh, things no, we're, considered... We're still incompetent. All things <laughs> considered, like, none of us have degrees in history or anthropology or... Some of us or don't even have degrees. Hey, I was um, gonna get a history degree, but okay, then I, I took, didn't. I took, <laughs> I took four separate classes of art history. Um, well, that, that hey, and I've that's been, history, bud. I've been to Europe. Oh, um, Europe. Yes, I've been to where you're a peon. So, I mean, I think that automatically makes you more qualified to talk yeah. about historical happenings than like saw, 90% of Americans. I saw all yeah, the for old, sure. I saw all the old buildings. <laughs> and the I really learned about ones. all the space aliens on the History Channel, which the luckily, ones that okay, helped them build luckily, them. 
the thing is, is I'm really bad at research. So the thing is, is you have volunteered to actually do all the research, and you are a thorough um, person with a level head and and a and a good summary, a good idea of a story. You know, you did you do the thing. You did the thing. So tell us about the thing. Tell us about the thing, Pelican Man. Yeah, if I was gonna pitch a podcast, I was just figuring that it would be a little mean to like. Be like, hey, you guys want to come and be guests on this podcast? And then also, like, force you to do the research right off the bat. So I figured I would, for at least the first several episodes, I would uh, definitely be more than happy to just do all of the research. Uh, or if I'm just the all-time researcher, that's also fine. We have no idea how this is going to play out in the long term. Um, but yeah, so we're here today to talk about uh, Alexander Hamilton who has been recently made more famous by the musical What's your name, man? Alexander Hamilton. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I think Billy's exactly. actually seen it. So yeah, it was more... really good, actually. Yeah, I, saw it, uh, um, I saw it before the whole coof happened as well. Uh, I was I saw it at the Chicago Theater. Um, Did you just call me a libtard? Yes. Anyone <laughs> that's, who likes, that's... You saw it live, Paul? Yeah, I saw it live. That's fucking awesome. How was it? What? It I really enjoyed it. Yeah, it was it was cool. I mean, again, I really like musicals and I like history, so even though we'll get into some of the uh historical details that are kind of intentionally flubbed in Hamilton, like it's not meant to be perfectly historical, and obviously the first sign of that is the fact that you're, you know, watching a musical like the yeah. founding fathers didn't have rap battles to figure out like what the early government was going to be like in case like everyone's complaining like um, oh you know they have a black man play George Washington and I it's think, like uh, I think <laughs> epic rap battles of history would disagree with you <laughs> Damn it. that's the name I haven't heard in a long time <laughs> that would be so fucking cool to see live I know they have it live here where I live currently but, mm -hmm. like, good luck getting tickets. Right? Yeah, no, for sure. That's the other challenge of going to any, like, popular musical, I guess. But, yeah, so Alexander Hamilton, he's, like, an interesting person. Because before we get too far into this, I guess I should clarify <laughs> for anyone who's already being, like, an angry keyboard war warrior. Like, oh, how are you going to call, you know, Hamilton a member of, like, a cacistocracy or whatever? He's not incompetent necessarily, or he's not an idiot. Um, and no, he's not an idiot exactly. Um, and like a lot of his early life is definitely sort of admirable, but also the musical really glosses over a lot of poor and sketchy decision making that is definitely not great. It's also, you could say it's not terribly unusual either, but like it's it's not good and it's kind of fun to shed some light on that. I guess part of what I was wanting to do with this episode is that I've heard kind of based on the musical, I've heard a lot of like high school kids and people of that age group who basically their whole education of this era is from Hamilton the musical make comments like, oh, Hamilton, you know, it would have been great if Hamilton had been president or something. Think of how much better the country would be today, you know, if he was more in charge back then or if he had lived longer or whatever. And I kind of wanted to show that might not be the case. So I don't want to completely discount Hamilton ever did. He also, uh, Hamilton, he was a big supporter of making U.S. money um, base 10 because, again, he was the Secretary of Treasury early enough where, you know, they were still figuring out what the currency was going to be. And he wanted to make it base 10, which, like, good thumbs up because before then, uh, Spanish money was really commonly used in the colonies, what which is, is base 8, which is just why. What is um, base 10? I'm not familiar with the term. You, I mean, you mean like, a, I just mean like div divisible by 10. You know what I mean? Like, a, oh, know, gotcha. So okay. Like yeah. A, a cent is 100 of a, of a, a hundredth of a dollar, you know, yeah, yeah, word. a tenth of a dollar. Yeah. As opposed to that, like, that I just mean, seems to make sense. An eighth kind of makes sense if you're going to half shit, if you're going to break something in half, like if you're dealing with a gold coin, right? Mm -hmm. So what you would do is like, well, uh, this isn't worth a whole gold coin. So we'll cut the coin in half. So then you have half a coin. And then it's like, well, I, I need to spend half of what I have left. So then you cut that in half and then th you end so up with on until you haven't. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
And then and then that's when you call up your boy and you're like, "Yo, I need an eighth." And he shows up and you need an eighth. <laughs> <Cut> Nice. <laughs> So what I think is funny about the musical, because we're going to reference the musical a lot, or at least I am, and Billy probably will too, since he's seen it. Um, yeah. Uh, Dylan has not seen it because uh, as I, I, I do feel which, bad because I do. I'm going into this one. Cold. I'm going to say sidebar about the musical. I just looked up tickets because I was like, it's showing right now because I see billboards for it on my way to work all the time. I just looked up tickets. I can get two right now because they're sold out other than these two. They're fucking eight thousand dollars a piece. Oh my gosh, eight thousand one hundred and eighty-three dollars. <laughs> the, the like, tickets... I was like, yeah, that might be fun to go to. No, it's not that fun. The tickets for the musical cost more money than the bribe that Hamilton pays uh, to keep <laughs> his affair quiet. <laughs> Hell yeah, that's fantastic. <laughs> uh, oh. I mean, That's you great. could, you might be able to look at, and and I'm sure this is kind of, this is how a lot of, this is how a, a lot of liberals will look at, will compartmentalize something. You might be able to look at a, a figure like Hamilton or like a lot of figures from, you know, near liberal history and say this figure was really good. They did some good thing, but then you look at the system in which they worked in and the things that they facilitated despite their virtues, and you say that's a cac- cacistocracy. You know what I mean? Yeah, and you, you know. could argue a lot of early American government, like many governments, is just kind of cobbled together. Like, there's some very good ideas, that, which is why it persists to this day. There's also some pretty bad ideas. I mean, there uh, was the genocide. There there's, was, yeah, there's that. Uh, there's, you know, uh, the three-fifths compromise and all that fun stuff that, you know, isn't oh, is great. That, is that the thing about, like, the slaves? Oh, I'm sorry. The prisoners with jobs. <laughs> so how many how many slaves, like if you had a slave pinball machine and Alexander Hamilton went up and, and played a game, how, how what was his slave score on the He on the has slave pinball none machine? as far none. as we are okay. Aware. So that's a pretty good score for I mean, as far as being woke as a founding father, that's you're doing better than Hamilton Washington was actually and, against slavery. All right. Uh, okay. At least in his writings and such, and he would. This but is one not, of the things that sort of emphasized a lot in the with musical. His bros, not when he was with the, in the locker room, right? I mean, That's he one. wrote he wrote publicly about how you know slavery is sort of incompatible with a lot of the American ideals that we sort of were promoting back then. Um, and in fairness, like a lot of other founding fathers acknowledge that, but just also owned slaves at the same time. They're like, no, no, no. I see your point. But, but, yeah. <laughs> but yeah but this is really easy to have them do my work right? yeah like, i'd have to pay people if we got rid of the slaves and that would just be hard so can't have that i already paid for the people so why do i now have to also pay the people i'm confused you know that you know that holds up it's like it's like it's like buying instead of renting kind of thing Yes. I do know, yeah, Hamilton was born in the Caribbean. Yeah, so this is actually part of why he probably was against slavery, is Hamilton is born on an island in the Caribbean called Nevis. Um, and sort of fun side note here, the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis uh, today is the smallest country in the entire Western Hemisphere. Oh, uh, shit, I didn't know that. Yeah, so when Hamilton was born, though which is either in 1755 or 1757, because apparently we can't figure out when people are born um, in history. Um, in fairness, Hamilton actually kind of contributes to that in his own writings, the confusion. But anyway, British, regardless of which year it was between those two, um, Nevis was a British crown colony at the time. And the primary industry on the island was, well, was sugar. He trying, was he trying to like lie on his ID to get alcohol or something? Well, it's actually the opposite. We believe he might have been lying that he was younger, either to try and like have an easier time getting like apprenticeships or like getting into education and stuff like that. Ah, uh, um, he's trying to get a scholarship. Yeah, mm, so get that grant money. Or maybe it's just because he was very vain. You know, he wanted people to think he was mm, you know like pretty boy. young, pretty spry boy, lad. Young spry hairless 
But uh, so. yeah, at the time, Nevis is a British colony. Um, the primary industry is sugar, and it's obviously extracted through, you know, slave labor plantations because that's just kind of how most of the New World operated at that particular time in history. And if I'm not mistaken, sugar is also one of those crops. Like, there's the brutal heat, but then it's also very labor-intensive. I mean, copper was... Uh, I mean, cotton was kind of bad because, like, you had to pick it and, like, you know, it, it would wear your hands down, I believe, picking all the stuff out of it. But, like, I think sugar cane, like, the heat and just the, the work it took to, like, cut it all up and process yeah. it was especially, you know, brutal as far as, like... Because, yeah, how do you sugar cane? A scythe? Like... I'm actually not super familiar with, like, the mechanics of harvesting sugar at this time. I mean, but, yeah, I'm, like, I mean, I sugar canes are... You, I, I think you lop it, you... It, I think... I remember seeing a, a documentary or something about it, but it's probably a process where it's, like, you, you cut the stalk down because it grows... I think it grows kind of like a bamboo, like <laughs> a stalk, like a long stalk. And then yeah. that, you process, you, like, boil it and process it and mush it. Um, and then you can you can get sugar from that process i'm probably totally wrong yeah no i looked it up it says yeah you have to manually trim the shoots to the ground and then you have to trim the excess leaves to protect the root so the crop will stay strong hmm. so yeah i assume you'd probably do that with like a scythe so that'd be some fucking hard work yeah and also like what sucks too is like at this point i mean i guess at this point there's no like it, there's really no way to be like a runaway slave in the same sense that like uh there is later on where you know you have like free states and slave states. Well, they're like, on an island. As well, yeah, well. everywhere is slave states, even you know in the U.S. at this point, which is you know a British colony. But yeah, also you're on an island, so it's like where are you going to run to? Mm. So there's really just no escape. You're just like in the Caribbean heat, cutting down small, like basically miniature trees is what like sugar canes seem yeah, like to God me. Damn. Like yeah, they just kind of suck. Um, and also Hamilton's not like super particularly well born. Um, so he probably maybe had a little more empathy, even though he's a white dude, uh, for, you know, the mostly African slaves that are oh, also but, being oppressed. But he was, he wasn't a white dude in the movie. <laughs> 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 anyway, um, so Hamilton, I is guess, the I, uh, never mind. Hamilton is the, uh, bastard son of a guy named James Hamilton and Rachel Fauchette or Fauchette. Neither of them are particularly important people. His father was a relatively unsuccessful businessman on Nevis, um, and he abandons the family when Alexander is 10, um, although they stay in contact uh, through writing. Um, basically, it's like a whole like saving face, and you know, society is very honor-based or whatever at this point, and the idea of sort of living with you know, your illegitimate family, I guess, is not highly looked upon. Um, but following that, you know, Rachel does her best to support the family, uh, but passed away three years later, leaving ha Alexander more or less orphaned because, again, his father's not really in the picture at around 13. Baller. Uh, although, so See, he briefly... kids these days, that's the problem with kids these days is they don't get the opportunity to work at that young age where they're really, like, susceptible to learn what it's like to get into the workforce. So, you know, that's probably why why this character did so well. But go on. I'm sorry. Yeah, to really interrupt. get that firm upbringing, like understands the how to work hard. Yeah. Uh, so he briefly moves in with his cousin who like pretty much immediately commits suicide as is Yikes. referenced in the okay. musical. So this guy is. Um, mm. See, I don't know anything about the musical. So this is all this is all vastly interesting, man. I wish I could have seen it portrayed with with uh, Grand Overture. <laughs> just imagine a yeah, swelling orchestra behind this hot whole podcast so your dad leaves you your mom dies of what what did you say cholera or fever or just she just the jitters uh what is it feminine hysteria probably that one yeah lord i was gonna say as well uh pardon my cough I have a. I think I'm catching a cold. The coronavirus. We or both, a coronavirus. We both have the cor Very colds, well. Be. Colds are technically coronavirus. We were just. I, we were just making out. I'm trying out to stifle. With, we were both making out with a bunch of strangers out in front of the hospital. So we think <laughs> yeah. we might have caught something. 
Yeah, that, and then, you know, every bathroom with a doorknob at the hospital, I made sure to lick. That's that's a thing, right? The lick challenge, is that a thing right now? He's been, his, cousin... he's been getting his face masks. He's just been going through the garbage bins from the ICU to find, like, the used ones in there, yeah. you know, save money. Is that not where you get yours? <laughs> I See, mean, dumpster diving is fucking penny pinching, See, right? What I've like, been doing I'm a savvy is, shopper. I've been getting toilet paper out of public restrooms, <laughs> and I've been looping it over my ears. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Just one ply toilet paper. No, no, I off. layer it. I layer it. <laughs> oh, yeah, good. Oh, excellent. Okay. So this is like this reminds me of a of a movie or but it's like so yeah so just three in a row he's like he's ten he's thirteen and then like his immediately as soon as he moves in his cousin is just like yeet <laughs> I'm out yeah so his cousin hangs all himself. right I'm gonna head I'm gonna head out yeah. Um, I'm gonna go hang out by this tree for a while. Uh, don't look for me. Um, yeah, so he uh, gets taken in by a merchant named Thomas Stevens. Um, there's like a little conspiracy theory that Thomas Stevens is actually Hamilton's real father. Um, that's mm. not well substantiated. I think it's um, probably more like in in Guardians in the of the Galaxy where his real father was the guy from walking dead yeah go on he, he, he might have been your father boy but he wasn't your daddy exactly and he's got a big red mohawk right yeah exactly that's actually all the all the paintings of thomas stevens show him that way rufio i knew it so however it was his in a certain way it was his correspondence with his actual father that would actually get him off the island so hamilton's an avid reader and his mother apparently owned 26 books, which is, like, a lot at the time huh. for, like, a regular person to own. Um, and so it's believed that Hamilton is, like, mostly self-educated through reading these books. Hmm. And then Hamilton wrote a letter to his estranged father following a hurricane on the island in which his description of the hurricane is apparently so graphic and moving that Hamilton's tutor, a reverend named Hugh Knox actually sent the letter in to a newspaper and it made such an impression on the community that the local leaders took up a collection to send Hamilton to the mainland of, you know, the colonial America to get a higher education. Damn, so, so he just, he just freaking, um, that's some, that's some, that's some, uh, really good prose. Apparently like it was considered like, just like some, remarkable feat for you know like a self-educated like teenager to write i mean if like... you've if you've experienced a hurricane they do elicit a lot of awe and creative inspiration that's just like that's the sigma the, the grind set of this kid he's just gonna like hurricane letter his way to the top <laughs> let's go uh He's so that, just like his country. He's young, scrappy, and hungry. Young, scrap. I was like, what's the middle <laughs> word? It was scrappy. Young, scrappy, and hungry. And he's, he's not, not throwing away, giving his, away shot. his shot. And arriving in America in late 1772, he starts his education at King's College, which is now Columbia. Um, and he starts rapidly doing what college students do, spouting off on you know fiery political positions. There is evidence he probably met Aaron Burr during this time, but, like, there's no evidence that he was, like, seeking him out as, like, a mentor. That was kind of invented for the musical. So Aaron yeah. Burr and Hamilton would seem to have, you know, more of, like, a long-running, keep bumping into each other before the tragic end. Um, but Aaron unlike Burr, most... sir. Yes. it's a, I do quite enjoy that number, but unlike See, most college shit. students, uh, Hamilton is actually pretty good... Yeah at like making clear and well reasoned points for his you know politics and he publishes his first two political writings because you know twitter wasn't a thing at the time so if you wanted to like spout off your opinions you actually had to like write a comprehensive essay and like have it published or something um so his first two writings are a full vindication of the measures of congress and the farmer refuted and both of these are actually responses to 
uh, loyalist writings written by Samuel Seabury, who wrote under the name Farmer. And he was, you know, basically just dissing the Continental Congress and saying, you know, this is stupid. And, you know, we should really just be, like, sticking with the king, our bro the king. Um, so, following the Battle of Lexington and Concord in 1775, Hamilton joins the New York Militia Company that will become known as the Hearts of Oak, which is, like, a pretty cool name. He's still a student at this point as well, and, like, a certain amount of the other students... Um, join the same company from King's and, College. And what he's, he's, so he's mostly studying politics. He said, like, so he's just he's just going right into like the nerdy ass political science degree. He's like kind of like doing like law stuff, you know, like a lot of uh, early politicians, a lot of America's like you know founders, so to speak, were all basically like lawyers. Okay, or, so definitely, you know, yeah, definitely try hard, hard law school. Try hard law school, something to prove. Scrappy, yeah, I got, I, I know a couple people. Young, scrappy, and hungry. Yeah, I've, we've, yes, we've established that. That's the one. That's the tune from the show. Then. Oh uh, no, I made that up. Oh wow, that's very talented of you. You should tell me more. I'm not throwing away my shot, and, unless he does <laughs> later. Ooh, ooh. Oh. All right, so I, I go, do. I'm love... gonna try to stop making references. I'm sorry. I'll, there will be more inevitably. It's just gonna happen. Oh yeah, it's it's gonna happen. And I will be oblivious to all of them. (laughs) The first notable action of the company is a raid led by none other than Hamilton himself to steal British cannons from Fort George, also known as the Battery or Battery Park in modern day Manhattan. Oh, fuck yeah. Uh, And this leads to like one of my favorite details of just like revolutionary conflict or militia warfare in general. Which is like once they steal the cannons, the Hearts of Oak just becomes an artillery company. Like, <laughs> I mean, like, that's you know, really infantry... what it makes. Yeah, that's the difference between an infantry company and an artillery company is you have artillery. Yeah, obviously, like you're maneuvering and like stuff is going to be way different. But like, it's just kind of funny. Like, yeah, they're an infantry company, and then it's like, well, we we got all these British cannons, so I guess now we're an artillery company. We're not just going to, like, hand them off to the next unit. It's like, ah, we're just going to absorb these and restructure. Um, It's just kind of funny, like, to imagine, like, a ragtag group in some Civil War today, like, managing to seize some, like, tanks. I I believe And they're like, I guess we're an armored division now. This is part of the, like, hollowed military tradition of, I called it. Or shotgun, if you will. That's That's where that comes from. (laughs) <laughs> you know, if you saw a shotgun on the ground, you could call it, and that was yours. So it's like the cannons, yeah. You know, if you joined the military oh. and like you found an Apache, you would then join the, <laughs> you would join the Air Force or, or what have you. Whichever bra- I don't even know what branch uses Apaches. I think technically the army is mostly That's operating right. the Apaches. They like but... the gunships because they they get to suck up all the bullets from the ground fire. So the the Hearts of Oak and Hamilton participate in multiple battles in 1776 and 1777, um, during which time Hamilton is captain of the company. The one thing that actually does kind of happen coincidentally that weirdly isn't mentioned in the musical to my memory is that uh, during one battle, Captain Hamilton's artillery company is rescued by a force led by Major Aaron Burr's infantry uh, oh, shit. groups. So yeah, that's kind of interesting. So that is actually one real encounter they had, but just isn't brought up in the actual musical for whatever reason. Hmm. Um, but following this, so he's asked by why isn't he referred to as Captain more? And why doesn't he have his own serial? That's the really important thing. Uh, well, you know, eventually he kind of works his way up the rank, so it's kind of like, of you know, you, I guess you refer to him, like, if you are retire as a general, right, like, nobody calls you, like, you know, first lieutenant, even though you were technically a first lieutenant at one point, it's like, we're just going to call you whatever you were last, I suppose. And also, I guess he's most well known for, like, his, Well, let's, you know, let's civ- get there, Tell, let's see, it. let's hear it unfold, because I don't know, okay, okay, I've never sorry. seen the musical, so I don't know where this is going. This is ex- it's kind of exciting. It's like a brand new story. <laughs> well, I hope I can be as you know thrilling in the telling the as Lin Manuel Miranda. And turns. 
and so the balance turns. Okay, I'll stop. <laughs> um, following this, uh, George Washington asks him to become his aide, and Hamilton accepts, serving under George Washington for four years with the rank of lieutenant colonel. Um, and he's like doing, apparently, he's like a pretty good aide. Like, Washington really trusts him. Like, Hamilton issues orders, like, with Washington's like seal and everything. Like, he's like a good writer, he's good at his job. But this whole time, like, uh, Hamilton kind of wants to get back to the actual fighting, which is referenced in the musical. He actually, you know, he wants to win glory for himself. He's not going to win glory, like, riding a desk, writing the, you know, general's letters or whatever. He wants to actually, like, go out he and He wants lead. the red mist. He wants to, he wants to hunt <sighs> Lieutenant Colonel Hamilton. So that's why he's not Captain Hamilton. But ha- Captain Hamilton just has a nice ring to it. Lieutenant Captain <laughs> Colonel Hamilton. You just, keep, <laughs> like, you just keep adding them, right? That, that would be amusing, yeah. You just keep all your titles. Like, this is second, first, Captain, Major, Lieutenant, Colonel, Colonel, uh, Brigadier, whatever. I, I Once you get to the generals, I have to actually think about the order of the ranks. Um, That's honestly impressive that you know so many. <laughs> um so he ke- so Hamilton uh, after four years he keeps bothering Washington about you know getting back into the field and this actually leads to kind of like a little tiff between the two of them um, in which Hamilton briefly leaves General Washington's staff which is kind of unlike the musical which makes it seem like Washington like sends him home but it's pretty much Hamilton's choice uh, so whatever. So still, he keeps bothering Washington. He keeps writing him letters. So wait, wait. So wants... why did he? Why did he leave? I'm sorry. Did I miss that part? Did I zone out? What, was there a? Well, because Hamilton really wants to be like a field leader. Oh, Hamil- okay. And, he uh, went Washington... back to the red mist thing. We went on a. We went on a. Cycle. Right. And Washington feels like he needs. He wants someone with like more experience mm. or whatever leading the troops. So he keeps bothering Washington that he wants to be put back into the field as a commander. Um, and so eventually Washington gives in. And lets him command an infantry battalion just in time for the Battle of Yorktown. So, this is like perfect timing for Hamilton wanting to win glory. Because the Battle of Yorktown represents the decisive British defeat in the Revolutionary War. Yes, I've heard, so, of, I've heard of that war. That's the one with the revolution in it, right? Yeah, well, there's only ever been one revolution, yeah, so yeah, that's the, the one. Well, the, one, the only important one that mattered that wasn't, you know, bad. All other revolutions are bad, but this one's... History started in 1776, and everything before that was a mistake. Um, uh, sure, we'll, we'll <laughs> go with that. Yeah, we'll go with that. <laughs> All right. Um, so to set the stage for the Battle of Yorktown, uh, a force of about 10,000 men, these are the Loyalist troops, which consists of 7,000 or so British men and 3,000 German mercenaries are holed up in Yorktown, which is in Virginia. Um, Now, the American force consists of between 8,000 and 9,000 troops from America, as well as about 7,500 to 8,800 French troops. Wee wee. So, wee wee, they get... Um, there's, there's also, I guess I should put out, there's like some speculation that, um, Hamilton had like some French tendencies with some like French leader. Uh, that's also pretty much totally unsubstantiated. Um, but anyway. Wait, are we, are we going back to French te- tendencies as it's in you? That's going to be, yeah. Ah, yeah, I okay. think we, we need to make that a recurring bit for the podcast. We're keeping that know, alive. French tendencies. Well, yeah. we might as well get a P.O. box for the hate mail if we're going to start there. <laughs> no one's listening in France. Um, um, no, monsieur. Um, so, a total force of between 15,000 and 18,000 uh, pro-American forces, we'll say, are fight facing off against about 10,000 pro-British forces. The French also are providing a blockade of 29 warships, which prevents the bo- possibility of the British escaping by sea. So, therefore, we're set to do a siege. 
um, which the siege basically consists of the Americans and the French is digging it, trenches. Is, is it a siege? Is it a siege if it's from the sea? A siege or a siege, maybe? So you've got, is that like, you remember in like the um, Age of Empires, you'd get the bombard ship? You'd have like the big cannon. That, were they were they doing that? Were you doing like some some classic like let's let's? They were. I mean, they were like obviously bombarding the British positions. Um, most of them were like by land, as far as I can tell. I would assume the French ships like were you know and shooting just, some rounds off. No, but... at, th- at this point, Hamilton has has no longer. He hasn't ha- held on to his cannons. Someone else has called his cannons, and now he's got a cavalry. Group no, he's got no? so he's got um he's got a whole like infantry battalion now. Oh, okay, so, so he's he's got some numbers. Got a, so how about how many men is that under his camp command? You might have I believe it's about it. four hundred total men that he has under his command Damn. at this time. So the uh, again the siege, America and France were like digging trenches towards the town to like you know move in close to the British fortifications. And also we're just like blowing the crap out of them constantly with artillery. Um, And on October 14th, Washington decides to use the Moonless Night to launch attacks to capture two key British redoubts that'll give them like, you know, pretty good overlook of the town if they're taken. Um, And this is also where he gives the order from the musical that no musket should be loaded by the assault teams to avoid giving away the attack with a stray shot. Um, as opposed to the musical where it kind of makes it seem like that's Hamilton's idea, but whatever, <clears throat> that's fine. Um, Hamilton leads the American attack on readout 10 while the French will attack readout nine. Uh, and both attacks end up going successfully with the readout seized. So Hamilton secures the readout and takes the British major who's commanding the readout prisoner along with most of the garrison there. Uh, and he loses nine men killed in the assault from his force of 400, um, which is pretty good for, like, a offensive operation against a fortified position. Yeah, um, absolutely. It's also it's also kind of in keeping, though, with, like, the total casualties in the battle. Like, it's this is a weirdly low casualty battle. Can you guys care to guess how many people will actually die in the battle? So, again, the Americans have to 15... I'm gonna go. I'm going to go with just 69. Not too far off. So the Americans, all in all, for the whole battle, will lose 88 men, and the British will lose 150. Oh, dubs. And again, this is a this is a force of like 15,000 versus 10,000. So these are like pretty small numbers overall. Did ever, were they just like out of powder at this point? Was there a lot of well, like, was there a lot of just shoving each other like <laughs> just kind of slapping? No. Um, I think it was just more like understanding that the jig was up. So after successfully taking the positions, the Americans and the French are now in a far better position and they can move the artillery in closer to lay way more effective fire on the British positions. Um, And so then the British decide to begin negotiating surrender on October 17th. Well, you know, artillery adds dignity to what would otherwise be an ugly brawl. So 8,000 men are taken prisoner (laughs) along with virtually all of the British military equipment in the town. Um, And the war doesn't end formally for two more years, but this is like kind of the end of the land fighting on the American continent. Like the, this is the point where it's like understood that, yeah, that this is no longer going to work. That this has gone too far out of control and the British have just basically lost an entire army so they uh it's over this is the decisive moment as i said no i remember this one from the patriot and like the french guy was there from like you know all of those movies where he plays the french guy ah oh, lafayette oh oui wee oui. yeah now you may be wondering up to this point like alexander sounds pretty cool aside from being a glory hound and sort of whiny um, but this is cacistocracy, and we're co- here to cover incompetent decisions. So this episode's really more about what Hamilton does when he actually comes to government power, um, which is also maybe less so incompetent, more just like being kind of unfit, <laughs> which like most government leaders. Um, 
So Hamilton returns to New York. Is it because he doesn't want to let go of the cannons? He keeps dragging with them, them through a, with through the office. <laughs> he, he, yeah, he keeps them in his office. There's like twenty of them or whatever, and like no one can get through the door. They're like, uh, "Mr. Secretary of Treasury, we need to talk it's to you." It's a fire hazard because like... there's powder everywhere. <laughs> 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 he uh, institutes the world's first instead of like a gold standard. He's got like the cannon standard. The currency yeah. is backed up by cannons. That's something I can get behind. Something, something for the Second Amendment people. Am I right? It's about time. <laughs> so Hamilton returns to New York, uh, where he becomes a lawyer and a tax collector. So like two for two on that one like well liked positions yeah so a lawyer and a tax collector walk into a bar and the bartender says hey it's alexander hamilton uh, walked into a burr okay oh yes yeah, so that would have been better that would have been good um spoilers we keep spoiling it for dylan i, did, I didn't so, get the reference so nothing is spoiled <laughs> Yeah, don't worry. I, we'll get you'll we'll, we'll get there. Uh, we'll get there. Like I, I feel like the big dum dum of the episode, and that's no, that's it's good. Cool. I think it's fun the fact that's that you cool. don't know this. It's quite entertaining, actually. Because I literally, I, I, I don't even remember that much about the Revolutionary War. Like I literally remember learning about this in elementary school, and but it's, like yeah, all of my memories of this stuff are like from like the Patriot with Mel Mel Gibson. Mel Gibson guitars, right? That's the guy. That's the guy. And he stabs That's the, the guy with the flag. So, I so I'm imagining he's really popular, and so he's this is now he begins his political career though now. So this is like uh, this is like every this is like like a lot of politicians do this route as they go. Yeah, know, they go in the military and all that. They stuff. win the glory, <coughs> in then fairness, they use that at in their point, campaigns, and they become really. Then they become like John Kerry and John McCain, and yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. In fairness, at this point, um, since obviously the country has just you know come into existence through armed conflict, it kind of makes sense that like, yeah, basically the majority of the leadership are going to be people that were also you know active in the military that just helped create the country. So that's somewhat logical. Um, I mean, if you're, you know, going to be a militarized state, yeah, of course. <laughs> which we're really, the United States isn't actually at this point, but yeah. I mean, we'll get there. Maybe eventually. maybe a sign <laughs> of things to come. It's interesting. Yeah, because it didn't... The founders were really terrified of, like, a large standing army because, you know, they just fought one. So they <laughs> really, a lot of them did not like having... We'll actually get to that. Sorry. Spoilers. Anyway. <clears throat> so, um, Hamilton has a very short-lived career at this point of being a representative from the state of New York to the Congress of the Confederation. And remember, this is pre-Constitution. So, this is the United States as governed by the Articles of Confederation. So, if you don't know anything about that, the Articles of Confederation are like the like um, alpha version of the Constitution. Yeah, word. Where, where it just kind of sucks. Yeah, this and, is like, before they. Well. Yeah, they were still using like free assets from the Unity Store, basically. Yeah. yeah. Um, nice. and so Hamilton only serves for about a year before returning home to practice law again, and his resignation is largely to do with his frustration over Congress's lack of power. Uh, the Congress doesn't actually have any enforceable means of collecting money, which is great. It's kind of important if you're a government. You need Wait, to sort so of have if they like didn't have people. that and he becomes a tax collector, what the fuck is he doing? Well, for the state of New York. Oh, so he had state taxes. The states, they're, they're all doing stuff. Like, they have more power at this point, but the actual federal government is pretty much useless. Wasn't uh, they, not wasn't much has changed. was that kind of the point? That was kind of the point, but it was like a little too useless. It's generally agreed, even amongst uh, a lot of the early founders. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be fun though if we didn't, and then like we all had different like light sockets and stuff, and like <laughs> you had to have like different passports. <laughs> Just every to, like, state Kentucky is basically its Virginia own country. And... The loosely United States. You look down at Texas, and it's like taking over half the south and armed conflicts or something and then we could have like um, our own version of the european union form with its own austerity crisis oh we basically just did that all in reverse somehow reverse reverse okay 
So, the, so <laughs> anyway, so the most, so the, <laughs> at this point in the Continental Congress, the way they collect money is they ask all of the states if they would please donate pretty, some of the money please. that they were getting. And this works about as well as you might expect, uh, as in they basically never got any money. So the most specific bill, though, because even though they don't have any means of collecting money, they have a bunch of money they owe people, you know, because they've been borrowing money like during the war and also to pay their soldiers and stuff. Um, that's the most immediate bill that needs to be paid is all the soldiers of the Continental Army, many of whom haven't been paid for months or maybe even like years, basically. I remember a lot of them didn't a lot of them sell their debt early. Yes, I see. That yeah, is a see, big part of what Hamilton uh, is involved I, in. I actually, learned, I know a few things about history there. Yeah, a lot of them got completely hosed. It's so a, a, a long-standing government tradition in America of screwing over veterans is that yeah, a lot of these guys get like absolutely hosed. Like they're supposed to get become you know pretty well off, and then they have to trade in early to to like survive the winter or whatever. Yeah, I don't mean to get ahead. If that was if that was part of your story, if that was part of your we your... we we will get to that Ooh. soon. Yes. What was the term that we learned uh, the last podcast about collecting money? Uh, scudage. 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 That, that's not in effect at this point because you know there's no nobility also, or lords. Yeah, or whatever, okay, but yes. that's what they should have done. <laughs> they like go around to all the. All the plantation owners, like either you personally will have to fight or give us a bunch of I slave money. I think they should have. Yeah, I think they should have done tote bags. <laughs> <laughs> they, they could have done like a raffle. They could have like had like a musket signed by George Washington or something, and they're like, "All right, you know, two dollars to buy a ticket." I would love to have a musket signed by George Washington. <laughs> It'd be pretty sweet. <laughs> um, so. This, uh, again, the most pressing matter, though, is that Congress needs to pay the soldiers, um, but they don't really have the money to do so. So, in the meantime, they tell the army to go disband, because, again, they don't like standing armies, and they don't have anything to pay them with, and there's really no enemy to fight anymore, so they're like, alright, just, you know, go home, and we'll get you the money eventually. Now, Hamilton tells Washington, because a lot of the officers in the army... You know, they want their money, right? And so they kind of are moving up to Philadelphia like, hey, it would be nice if we could get some money. And there's essentially a mutiny because the officers don't want to disband until they get the money. Um, and to be clear, like, nothing actually violent really happens, but we were, like, very, very close to essentially, like, a coup of the Continental Congress extremely early on. And Hamilton was not helpful in this. Hamilton tells Washington that he wants to assume some sort of leadership of the army and encourage the officers not to disband and to use the army to secure funding for the pay they are owed, but to make sure that nothing gets too far out of hand. Um, if this sounds like a slippery slope to the army just like storming the Congress, it's because it like definitely is. <laughs> um... So, thankfully, Washington, for all his faults, uh, continues to be, like, the guy that America really needs at the time and tells Hamilton that using the army to secure congressional spending is, like, a really bad idea and goes and meets with the officers in the army personally to tell them to relax and disband. And it's true that they should get the money, but it also would have been, like, probably a death blow to the early United States if they had, you know stormed continental congress at this mm -hmm, point mm -hmm. so yeah it's you know if, it's if, a mixed bag if, like it i mean you say it's a bad move but if anything if i've learned anything from like crime movies it's a pretty bad move to not pay your muscle as well that's mm -hmm. it's not a, that's not a good look i was thinking earlier it's like you know this was before football it's like they should have just you know had them go go around and and, and do sports and, and put on shows <laughs> <laughs> they're just like raising money like the performing us just army have them, yeah just <laughs> on parade <laughs> just like all those captain america bits where he like lifts the motorcycle over his head just just put the boys to work you know what i mean america's ass 
so it's uh, it's after this incident that Hamilton resigns and goes home. Um, a year of practicing law in, in which he amusingly ends up like one of his specialties is defending British loyalists in lawsuits. Um, so he, he helps to start the Bank of New York, which still exists today as the BNY Mellon Bank. Um, oh. now, Hamilton, like, this is, like, you know, an important part, I guess, in him getting, like, experience with financial institutions. But he's not really, like, a huge part of it. He owns one and a half shares out of a total of 723. Hmm. Okay. So he, he gets his, like, he's getting his toes in the water, you know, doing money stuff. Um, well, you and know, about buy, this time, buy low, in, sell high, right? That's how that works. Yeah. So about this time in 1786, Hamilton gets interested in the Annapolis Convention and the talk of a new U.S. Constitution, which he sees as a chance to bring a strong centralized government into existence, which he views as necessary for the nation to truly be, continue to be like effective and existing. Um, and he gets chosen by his father-in-law to become a delegate to the Constitutional Convention from the state of New York. So some of Hamilton's ideas for the new United States include the following. The president would serve for life. This was widely ignored. Uh, <laughs> sen <laughs> senators would also serve for life. We laugh at, we laugh at that, and yet the Supreme Court. Uh, yeah, but it's, you know. Yeah, no. The president would have an absolute veto, which could not be overridden. Um, state governors would be appointed by the federal government. So H Hamilton's plan would have massively consolidated government power into the, you know, centralized federal government. And it's almost certainly never would have been approved or accepted by the okay, actual state. Okay, see, this is why it makes yeah, sense sure. why libtards like him. I didn't know. I didn't know why. I just knew libtards liked him. I just saw that association, and that totally makes sense. I'm sorry. I, I know that's a pejorative. I feel like Dylan has to clarify that he's actually like a pre-liberal liberal. person for the amount of time he's said libtard. Well, when I say that, I mean like a neoliberal. There's a specific. Yeah. It's a specific flavor. I don't know. Um, don't don't cancel me. I'm not even on Twitter, so it wouldn't even be worth your time. But no, I mean just because there's a um, generally liberals like the as far as you know your your establishment liberal, um, not in your not in just the general sense of someone who wants to liberalize something like the word the word has lost all meaning. So like it's almost it's almost easier to call someone a libtard because it's more of a pejorative of a certain type of person who believes in a strong federal government because it's like. You know, the federal government's never done anything wrong, ever, never will again. I digress. So what? So Hamilton wants to make basically the Men in Black in charge of this. He's the one who wants to found the deep space, uh, deep state. Basically, <laughs> what you're telling yes, Hamilton me. Hamilton wants to start the deep state. This is it's um, all coming together, folks. He gets and he gets accused by a lot of uh, his fellows and peers of being like a monarchist, essentially. And he does actually have a lot of like positive things to say about the British system, which is kind of funny since they've just fought a war against. And them. he's like getting he actually, and he's getting loyalists off the hook, huh? So he's kind of maybe he's having second thoughts. He's getting a little buyer's remorse. It's Maybe, like, man, why know. can't we go? Kings were so much cooler, man. You got crowns and shit. Anyway. You get to wear, like, a cool robe. The president's not going to get to wear Dude, a cool robe. Dude, we do robe. need to bring back robes, man. I'm not yeah, going to lie. That definitely. shit looks comfortable. Kings are definitely cooler. Yeah, but we can all... We're just like, the president has to wear a cape. We can all and wear robes, though. Carry a scepter. We can all wear robes. Like, I think we should bring <laughs> Just everyone. Robes. Yeah. Okay. Nah, only kings can wear robes. So... Despite uh, not believing that the Constitution that the convention ended up, you know, going with, which is the one that we are aware of today, um, he, despite not really believing that one goes far enough, Hamilton still agrees to support it because he considered it a vast improvement over the Articles of Confederation. And not only does he support it, he goes like whole bit in here. So he ends up being a real fighter for the Constitution and is probably the reason why New York votes to accept it. Uh, he pushed the New York state legislature, legislature really hard to ratify it, and it still barely passed. Mm. So he was basically the clutch player on the New York team in finals? 
Yeah. Like, he got the ace right at the end. He, he really was pushing the other yeah. members to, like, really vote he, yes he to do, He diffused the veto on the floor. Word. Okay. Yeah. Cool. I understand history. I understand history, people. Come on. No one was calling any doubt, right? Um, this also brings us to the Federalist Papers, which is a series of essays written by Hamilton, John Jay, and James Madison that uh, promotes the document, the Constitution, to the public. Um, and also, unlike in the musical, there is no evidence that Alexander Hamilton ever approached Aaron Burr and asked him to write any of the Federalist Papers. Again, this is probably just made up, so that way it makes it seem like Hamilton and Burr were more involved. It's a, it's kind of yeah. like, so that what I'm getting <laughs> from this is that the Hamilton musical is kind of like Back to the Future, where Marty goes back and takes credit for civil rights. So, like, they're making it where Hamilton goes back and takes credit for all of, like, the great things that happened with early America. Even though he wanted, like, a king president. And king senators... <laughs> could you imagine, as shitty as senators are now, could you imagine if senators served <laughs> for life? That would be the worst thing in the world. It would be pretty awful, yeah. We're already, imagine... we're already waiting for half of them to die. <laughs> I want if look if we're if we're doing that if we're gonna do the four life president we have to go all in and hook him up into machines and make him the immortal god emperor god emperor and use his yeah, psychic we use his psychic energy to as a beacon it's for like our a, fleet in hyperspace. It's like Mister House in New Vegas, right? Like, <laughs> more. Let's do one of those. Situations. More or less, but also a lighthouse to the, the galaxy. There's so, always a lighthouse. Well, there's always a girl. So of the eighty-five, of the eighty-five Federalist Papers, uh, Hamilton will write fifty-one of them. So he's just like a fanatic. It's, yeah, that's fucking nuts. John Jay will write five, and James Madison writes twenty-nine. Um, now originally, I think there were only supposed to be twenty-five. So like, even James Madison goes above and beyond. But yeah, Hamilton's just like on crack or something over Our there. Achiever. Something something he brought with him from the Caribbean. Um, Could you imagine like? Um, he would be so he would be a pretty uh, like hardcore poster right now you think yeah he'd be doing a whole bunch of like twitter rants and you yeah, know part he, he'd have like where the people like they can't fit it all to, in one yeah. tweet, so it's like one of seven or whatever he'd be like one of 82 yeah like, yeah it'd be way too long you know, that's a bummer. He'd actually probably just be a podcaster. He'd probably just be like... He, yeah. He'd be like one of those guys that does the four-hour commentary for the two-hour movie. <laughs> yeah, a, there you go. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, Madison and Hamilton, despite writing together and working together to you know promote the Constitution, they do differ a little bit on certain details. For instance, the adoption of the Bill of Rights. Madison was a firm supporter of the Bill of Rights as being necessary to add to the Constitution um, and is probably a big part of why we actually ended up getting them. Uh, Hamilton does not support a Bill of Rights because he doesn't view them as being necessary. Quote, the Constitution is itself in every rational sense and to every useful purpose a Bill of Rights. Hamilton in Federalist 84. So... Does the musical address this, that he was like... No, no, it doesn't. Okay, actually, I should mention one thing. Hamilton, at one point, when he's talking to Burr in this conversation that never happened, um, and Burr says, like, the Constitution is a mess, it's full of contradictions, and Hamilton's like, so it needs amendments. And you're sort of led to believe, I feel like, that he, that's probably meaning, like, oh, Hamilton's talking about the Bill of Rights. But, like, no. If anything, the only thing we could... Again, that conversation never happened, so it's like, who knows what Lin-Manuel Miranda's interpreting or trying to say there. Like, you could say it's maybe him, like, I don't know, saying he needs more of his monarchist reforms or something, but Hamilton did not actually support the Bill of Rights. And we need a court so... jester appointed by the <laughs> Supreme Court. The, the, the Supreme Court jester. <laughs> Honestly, that should be a thing, because that's just like... That would be great. That could... And that's the person who we get to play Joker in the Batman movies. Is the Supreme Court yeah. Jester. Oh my there's, a, God. there's a constitutional what amendment that if there is a And Batman that's how movie we get at the Supreme Court. That's Jester. how we get rid of Jerry Leto. <laughs> we make him the Supreme Court Jester. Um, so 
Yeah, I mean the Bill of Rights is it's it's kind of nice. Like it's it's got there's some good there's some good shit. I mean there's some you know, um, it's like here's the thing. I'm not saying that the government's done a great job of actually holding to any of them, but it's kind of hard to imagine like how much worse things might be if you didn't have that fallback of like no we're allowed to like assemble and protest here because you know it says so here i mean it's also largely ignored but like again how much worse could things be if you know you didn't have things up against you know unreasonable search and seizure freedom of the press right to assemble yeah like, well it's, it's like all laws it's a good like all thing. laws they're selectively enforced but that some you know as far as laws are concerned they're pretty good you know i i take those over a lot of other shitty laws so Hamilton doesn't think we need this, um, and this is based on the idea that technically the idea of the Constitution was a list of what the government could do. So if it's not in the Constitution, the government doesn't really have any power over it anyway. This becomes important later. Hamilton is either like deliberately being stupid here, or he's playing at something in like a subversive. That manner. seems like an, the um, ultimate. It's interesting because that seems like the ultimate conservative. Like he wants a, he he seems pro monarch, but like that's a very conservative or very like libertarian mindset, like of a government that can it can literally only do the things that we explicitly put into writing. Like that's that's a very limited government. That's a radically limited government. But then like there's kind of a contradiction if he he's gonna sit here and say like, oh actually he um, but he wants a king president that's there for life who. I mean, did he want the the king president to have more powers explicitly made? Like, I, I don't know. Yeah, it's going to get thrown out the window pretty mm. quick here. So, the Constitution does ultimately get adopted, and the Bill of Rights... Oh, they do! Uh, which Spoilers, we, bro! I didn't know! The Constitution, of course, does get adopted, um, which means that we get a president... And the president, George Washington, is the first See, pick. Hamilton's old I know war him buddy. from the money. Yeah, yes. both the little round so, ones and the flat paper ones, you know. So President Washington, he comes over to Hamilton and asks him to serve as the very first United States Secretary of the Treasury on September 11th, 1789. Oh, never forget. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> okay, so this leads us to the first report on the public credit. So... Now that the country has to pay its has actually has the means to pay its debt because the constitution gives the federal government the power to do that and actually you know raise money, um, they still have largely the same problem. They owe a bunch of soldiers a bunch of money for all the war stuff that we were doing. Now I shouldn't say the soldiers were paid in nothing; they were paid in IOUs. Congress gave them a bunch of slips saying they were owed money, and in the future, when it could be afforded, they'd get paid. And now that they had the power to tax and all that good stuff, they could actually afford to do it. Time to pay back the soldiers. Except one problem. Many of the soldiers were broke, right? So they had to get money from somewhere in the meantime while Congress was getting its act together. Remember, it's been quite a few years at this point. So a large number of the, the slips were sold to speculators, often for a small fraction of the slip's actual value. Basically, it was rich guys gambling. On like a proto title loan. I mean, it's not a, it's not a perfect metaphor because a title loan is for like a car or something you own, which this is debt that you own. So this would be like you know, it, it's a it's a it's it's part of the time honored tradition of well, ripping like a, somebody off so that they can get paid sooner. You know, like a cash checking like, place. Right. It's like a it's, it's like a, a line yeah. of credit almost, right? Yeah, or like just yeah, they're getting paid. They're they're trading. Well, okay, it's like so cash you're, for you're, gold. <laughs> yeah, so it's like yeah, it's okay, like you okay. have a you have a slip. You have the a IOU left over from the war. Like the government's like, okay, we owe you so much back wages. I like to call it lost wages um, from the war, and so we can't pay you that. But we're gonna give you this slip of paper that says that we owe you this. Well, you can go to somebody and be like, well, the government owes me ten doubloons. You sell me five doubloons, and then you can cash this in later because you have more money and you don't need money now. It's part of something called the time value of money, 
which is very important if you want to understand economics is that like a, you know a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush it's like yeah. it's it's better to have if you especially if you don't have any money it's you better to money. have money it's better to have money right away than you know hypothetically have it in the future so having a deed or a title that says that the government owes you lost wages doesn't get you fed you have to trade that in at a at a shitty rate like maybe getting like 50 cents on the dollar you know so that you can just afford to eat that winter you know or afford to get you know your rent or whatever yeah in this case it's that basically yeah what you're saying guys need money they need to like get food they need to figure out how they're going to live um and so these rich guys were essentially speculating on whether or not the continental congress would you know actually get its crap together one day and pay back the ious so they'd buy the ious at a fraction of their face value um, so that way the soldiers would obviously get some amount of money but usually it was a very small amount in some cases like a tenth of what they were actually owed um, Yikes. and you know maybe they'd get paid back by the continental congress someday so now there's this debate should we pay back whoever happens to be holding the slip mostly speculators or should we pay back the soldiers um, and there was some compromises that suggested trying to pay back both or you pay back the speculators like what they bought the slip for and then pay the soldiers like the difference or whatever um, this that's reminds me this reminds me of a certain housing crisis where they were they could either bail out the banks or the homeowners and i can't remember which one they went with <laughs> but go on i don't mean to cut you off uh yeah so that would be complicated they'd have to track people down they'd have to take some soldiers word for it how much they were owed and so hamilton comes up with a plan just pay the people who have the slips, regardless of who they are. James Madison, once again, that's like James Madison's like kind of a bro a little bit. Uh, he argues against this. He wants most of the money to go to the actual soldiers who like fought in the war, um, but he's shot down like immediately. Um, Hamilton's plan is quickly accepted, and despite the criticism that Hamilton's own father-in-law is one of the major speculators, um, the plan is adopted. And the uh, government just pays back whoever currently has the IOUs. So it's interesting. So this is kind of this is kind of a, a big old little critique of capitalism. I don't want to. I didn't want to say it. It's like Voldemort. If you say it now, it's, it's, I don't like that thing. But it's like, all right, you have a market. You have a marketized system. You have a profit motivated system. Well, right away you have cronyism you have corruption literally in the first administration you have your treasury secretary whose st whose family stands to benefit through a certain policy that he enacts and it's based off of literally the first thing that the government does is go to war and they somehow they somehow turn it into like a credit scheme and 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 do some like yeah okay mm, that's fun and this guy get and this guy gets to rap. This guy gets to do rap songs. Apparently, yeah. This uh, this part is basically not mentioned literally at all in the musical because you know. See, this is why popular. this is why I didn't watch it. Uh, like, I didn't have an answer to why I didn't watch this shit. Is because it's it's in in some ways, yeah, it's whitewashing, it's propaganda, it's bullshit. It doesn't it doesn't get into like. You know, it's gonna. You know, I doesn't, don't want to. I don't want to risk getting. I don't want to get risk getting starry eyed eyes for like some jackass. You know. I don't yeah. Know. So uh, this is also where we get the the thing that is talked about in the musical, the negotiation of uh, the federal government assuming all the states debts. So the federal government had debt, but so did a lot of the states, right, that they accumulated during the war. Hamilton's idea was, we'll just have the federal government assume all the debts, consolidate it. Um, and then, you know, that'll help create a more centralized uh, financial system that the federal government controls because, you know, now all the states are kind of had like, you know, he's consolidating financial power to the federal government. Um, and this is uh, so Virginia and Maryland are among the states that aren't the greatest in terms of like, you know, they don't like this idea because they've already mostly paid off their debts. Um, and, you know, if the federal government. It's kind of like when you get burden. married to somebody who still has student loans. <laughs> well, it's like, you know, the fe yeah, the federal government takes on the debt burden and now Virginia and Maryland are, you know, paying taxes to the federal government. And basically it's like... Oh, the... debt they already paid off, yeah. Right, now they're paying other states' debts. 
Um, and this is how you get the deal worked out, where they put the capital of the country between Maryland and Virginia in exchange for them, you know, supporting the idea of, you know, joining this whole consolidated debt thing. So that's how we get Washington, D.C. Um, you know, the swamp. We'll give you all the pretty flat the buildings. The swamp. The literal swamp that they built the nation's capital in. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Wasn't, wasn't, the, wasn't there, like, some guy that was going to, like, drain it or something? Wasn't that a thing? Uh, yeah, I think they kicked him out before when his job was still only half done or something. Though I'm sure he would have done it if he had gotten the you know remainder of the time he needed or whatever. Oh uh, no, it's cool. He's gonna get it. Okay, yeah, well, they'll I'm, prove. Yeah, no, he's, I'm they'll prove sure, back and finish the job. Pretty sure like swamps are like connected to the ocean most of the time. I don't time. think you can drain a swamp really. I think you kind of just have to fill yeah, it that's in. That's the natural yeah, my well, general understanding. You're I don't dealing know. you're dealing with like, you know, hydro hydro hydraulics, you know, g- geographical hydro I don't know what the specific term is, but like the the hydrology of of natural water formations. My great uncle once illegally filled in a swamp, so he should be president except you know, unfortunately he's dead. So mm. there you go. That's the problem. Um, now another thing you need when you start a new country is a national bank, uh, you know, to provide money to invest in new industry and all that good stuff. No, I am aware that like the actual formation of, of a federal bank was, that was something that was pretty highly contested, right? As a lot of people kind of like not into that. There's going to be, there's going to be some debate over this. So this leads to a twofold problem. The bank is supposed to be chartered by the government but it's also supposed to be largely privately owned to maintain its independence from the government. Um, the bank needs an initial pool of money to lend to people, right? Because you need money in the bank in order for the bank to be able to lend that money to other people. So the bank's going to be owned 20% Wait, by the federal government. Are you government. telling me that it's all a circle? Kind of, yes. Hmm. The ba- it's all in, the It's going to get a little more circular here in a second. So the bank's going to be owned 20% by the federal government, right? And the rest is going to go to private shareholders. The initial capitalization of the bank is going to be $10 million. So in order to own 20% of it, the government needs to buy $2 million. Simple math. Problem number one. They don't have $2 million. Yeah, they don't have the $2 million. So Hamilton has a great idea. The bank will lend the government $2 million. So that way the government can give the bank the $2 million. So that way the bank has the money to lend to people. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. Totally. Problem one solved. Problem number two. The constitutionality of the government chartering a bank. Objections are raised in the House of Representatives that the Congress technically didn't have the power to charter a bank since it's not listed in the Constitution going back to that point from earlier that Hamilton was talking about these and again Hamilton doesn't really care it's not listed in the Constitution Um, these protests primarily come from Thomas Jefferson and our old pal James Madison so remember when Hamilton was arguing that we didn't need a Bill of Rights because the Constitution only gives the government the power that it needs yeah just kind of forget about that hamilton yeah. invents the p- idea of implied powers to defend his new bank the classic flip-flop i know, yeah i see i see where this is going yeah implied powers for those wondering are the powers that are authorized by the constitution that while not stated seem to be implied hamilton is able to successfully make his argument and the president signs the authorization authorization to charter the bank into law. This is kind of based on the whole like how there's like the necessary and proper and like the Congress can do what it needs to do to like secure the general be- welfare because or, like, of the implication. The welfare. Yeah, and it's but it's also very vague be- too. Be- so because it's, because yeah. of the implication, you know, you're out. Yes. Yeah. So it's yeah. This is uh, also where Hamilton does the base ten thing again. We'll give him a point for that. So what? So he gave. So that's the one thing is we got is we got metric money. Yeah, we got metric give, money. Couldn't do metric hand, anything everybody. else, but we got metric money. So we're totally redeemed. Um, we now uh, the, we get around to the whiskey rebellion about this time. Um, this is sort of like the last major screw up 
in my opinion. Um, the Whiskey Rebellion is Hamilton needs to raise, you know, more money for the United States as the Treasury te Treasury Secretary. He gets to, you know, propose to Congress all the different taxes and ideas he has for making money. Um, and then Congress gets to vote on it. So one of Hamilton's favorite proposals is a sin tax, a tax on whiskey. However, there's a problem. The whole currency thing is still somewhat unsolved, and specifically in the frontier territory. Um, so it takes a long time for currency to get made and distributed, and it also takes a long time to actually convince the people that it's like worth circulating and you know buying stuff with. But I know what you can trade with. You can trade with whiskey, right? That is correct. Uh, hey. I, I remember this one. I remember. I remember the history. Yeah, because you could just, yeah, get back to, you could have a fourth. Again, back to, yeah, here's a fifth. <laughs> yeah, it's an easily divisible product, so you can, like, very easily, you know, give a small and or it's large amount. always in Dep demand. It keeps a very long time. Yeah, and it's useful for multiple purposes, and it, everyone always wants it. So it actually makes decent currency. And you can, it's like instead of having a Bitcoin rig to mine Bitcoin, is you have a whiskey rig. You to have mine, a still, to yeah. Mine, to still, yeah. There's that creepy dude that lives in his mom's basement, basement that's just, you know, distilling whiskey down there. It's like, it's going to be the new way of the future, let me tell you. Until it blows up like a meth lab. Whiskey coin. So we're gonna make a crypto <laughs> whiskey, whiskey coin. coin. Oh damn! I love that's it. how we. Genius. Yeah, that's how we finance the pod. That's how we get our. Yeah, and without uh, you don't mine <laughs> it. You distill it. That that's what you'll. Yeah. Like. Cacistocracy is now announcing our new <laughs> whiskey coin. Invest now on on all platforms like you know the the phone ones where you swipe to trade that are totally Patreon. legit and safe. <laughs> so. Um, a lot of uh, specifically in like the frontier territories like yeah whiskey is basically used as currency and also a lot of farmers would supplement their income by making whiskey or a lot of farmers would actually basically have their whole income by whiskey because they would you know if you're growing like barley or wheat it's kind of hard to transport a bunch of that in like a meaningful value quantity but you can ship it as yeah it, you can condense it process it condense it ship put it in a bottle Yep, and you can ship it off to, like, the more civilized parts of America at this point. Where they you know, empty it and then play a song on it on the corner. <laughs> so, basically, though, for, for all these guys who are using uh, whiskey as currency, this new whiskey task is, in all effectiveness, um, an income tax, which is a very unpopular idea at the time. Technically speaking, it's actually unconstitutional. Um... <laughs> That's funny because I could swear that, like, you know, yeah, we wouldn't have one of those. You wouldn't think we'd have one of those in a free country. <laughs> well, they did have to amend the Constitution to pass an income tax, but that's a whole separate story. Um, so the tax was, you know, a big burden on these individuals. And again, these are mostly like poor frontiersmen who didn't have a ton of money anyway. Um, so after a couple of years of basic resistance and meetings in which some areas just refuse to enforce the tax, an actual rebellion begins to materialize. In 1794, there's some skirmishing in West Pennsylvania between federal officials and the rebels, leading to a small number of deaths, including some of the rebels, a federal marshal, and a few civilians. Um, this escalates to the point where the U.S. government actually has to call up several state militias to go and repress the rebellion. Um, this will be the only time in history in which a sitting U.S. president leads soldiers on the field. Hmm. So. Pretty dope. Damn. George Washington, yeah, he goes out and he. Why gets isn't his that boys. a coin? George Washington yeah. repressing the Whiskey Rebellion. <laughs> oh. It's just a thing of him like kicking over some bottles where he holds a, while he holds a guy up with like a flintlock pistol. They should have done that. They should have rolled that out during the, you know, prohibition. It's been great. You know, I was one of those nerds that got the fifty state coins. I did too. And oh really? I, I don't have my collection. I had a whole. I did. I got all fifty of them, buddy. I tell I you. I tell to, uh... you what. 
If you, I always wanted to do that. I mean, if you go to a lot of arcades, it's not hard. You just have to stop and look at your quarters and save the ones. Nah, you have. before back when I was a poor boy, I would go to the laundromat to do laundry. You lived with me at the time, actually. Ah, so, yes. Yeah. But like, you know, everything only takes quarters at the laundromat, so I'd end up putting like a fucking ten in the quarter machine, and you get ten dollars worth of quarters. I always thought that would be a good way to. Uh, but you learn. Try to get all fifty you learn states. so much mm-hmm. on that little piece of metal about Missouri. <laughs> yes. Just all the racism encapsulated so, right there for you. So, what? So Captain Hamilton basically causes the first <laughs> insurrection Hamilton. in Colonel, America. Colonel Hamilton. I mean, we also had Shays Rebellion, but yeah, this is like you know the Whiskey Rebellion is the one big where deal. even the president had to like suit up and get his diamond armor out of out of his nether chest to go like I yeah. <laughs> Because you can't, you can't die as president. You won't respawn as president. You'll lose your XP on that, on that tier, yeah. on that, on that skill tree. So you have to, yeah, you definitely want to put your diamond armor once you, you become president. You get, yeah, you gotta get sharpness four. Yeah, he's gotta pull out his en- enchanted diamond musket to go lead the <laughs> army. Um, he doesn't actually lead any battles. To be clear, he just kind of goes out to the army because once the federal forces assemble, <clears throat> which I guess I should be clear. These aren't suit like federal forces. There's, uh, there's state militias that have been called up into federal service, but yeah, these are the state militia guys, and they're here to just serve Washington while it's necessary, and then they all go home, I guess. But at this point, there's actually no like significant battle. There's just some like arrests that happen because the rebels kind of understand they're outdone, um, because the federal force outnumbers the rebels more than twenty to one. Which is a deliberate show of force to get the rebels to stand down without further violence. It's another one of those shoving matches. We're ending this like how we started it, basically. Right. It's, it mostly works. A couple. It seems people, like a, a couple. It ha- seems like a lot of war for a long time was like people. I'm, I think a lot of those wars where people lined up on battlefields were a lot of like, hey, just yell at each other and and fire off a few rounds, and then one side will get scared and run off. It was actually, like, it was just an excuse to get out of the house and go, like, drink with your friends. Like, Honestly, like, how fucking accurate is a musket? Uh, horribly. Like they cannot, yeah, like, they can't be accurate. No, they're horribly they're, inaccurate. Like, they're smoothbore, too. Well, Rifling hasn't you, been invented Yeah, that's yet. why you do a volley. Yeah. That's why you shoot in a big in a big group. Well, of course, like, you, if everyone shoots at once, you're going to hit something, right? Like, yeah, you have to be pretty close to accurately hit anything with a musket. That's cr- I've never really thought about that. It's like, because, I mean, it's a gun, but it's like, yeah, it's a pretty shitty gun, huh? Yeah, because, I mean, I have a black powder rifle, but, like, it's... It's still rifled. It's still a rifle, mm. even though it's you know a muzzle loader. So it's like yeah, yeah like still gonna be way more accurate I mean, than what these guys are I guess are if using. you had like good ammunition, like if you had like the best musket and you were really good with it, and you understand, you know, there's always that weird. I mean, uh, there are certainly guys that are more accurate. It's like than others, it's like but... the guy at the skate park that has like the really shitty skateboard, but he can do all the best tricks somehow. Like it doesn't yeah. matter. Like one wheel you can, is like, very... you can hear his like busted. Yeah, bearing. he's like you can like <laughs> he hear him rattling by, yeah. by, and yet he can do like some kind of weird tray fl- flip and like grind across the bolt. Yeah, no, totally. Every time we're at the skate park and I see someone like that, I'm like, I just want to like buy them a set of wheels or something. No, it's it would like, totally ruin. It. it would totally ruin their their shit it would fuck them up yeah or they'd be like you know like i was when i was young and it's like i really need new wheels but god i can't afford that right yeah. i might make someone's day buying them i have a, that I ha- way off I have topic. a bunch of what are you talking about alexander hammer captain hamilton was famous for skateboarding it was in the musical documentary oh he was the original pro skater yeah he was i know he was a tony hawk alexander hamilton i know he was a tony hawk character right Amongst the other accomplishments, he was, yeah, the inventor of the skateboard, of course, as well. Another thing right? co-opted by Marty McFly. See, it's a circle. So, uh, the rebellion gets, you know, put down without actually much violence or fighting, um, except for two civilians that get killed during the arrests, I guess, one of which includes a child that is killed when an army officer... Okay. allegedly accidentally discharges his pistol so yeah just you know things don't change mm, hands up don't shoot 
couple hundred people are arrested um but most of the leaders kind of just like run away back into the frontier which is basically just beyond the reach of the federal government at this point um which is a disappointment to hamilton because hamilton really wants to like see as many of these guys hung as possible um and only two of the leaders are ever actually convicted of treason um and both of them are actually ultimately pardoned by president washington see what a bro like, gotta squash a beef early you know let, let bygones be bygones you don't want to like let this all draw out into some prolonged conflict but of course of course bloodthirsty hamilton he wants them all he wants them strung up on and drawn and quartered with his kingly mon- monarchist ideals Maybe Hamilton's the one who hung his cousin. Maybe he just has a thing for hanging. I don't Holy know. shit, dude. You know, he did like That's so he did like fuck. war a lot, right? He liked going off and killing people. Maybe he maybe that's why his dad left is because his son was such a fucking psychopath. Maybe he <laughs> killed his mom. Maybe that's why he was why she was sick cuz he was like slowly poisoning her. It's all coming together, man. It's all coming together. Remember the pyramids? Remember the pyramids? And the the pyramids are on the money that Hamilton helped create. Exactly, bro. Oh, shit. Shit. Next thing you're going to tell me he went to Yale. Uh, I mean, King's College eventually becomes Columbia. 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 I get them all confused as well. Columbia. In the midst of the rebellion, seemingly for family reasons, but also possibly because of, you know this horrible thing that's happening hamilton tenders his resignation on december 1st 1794 um he actually still issues a report on the way out of office including ideas that the whiskey tax was still a good idea and should be you know held on to um, but it's ultimately repealed in 1802 that it goes to show you kids i just want to say you got to fight for your right to party history shows time and time again so hamilton he retires um but he remains very politically active, writing and supporting different candidates or, you know, not supporting and basically doing hit pieces so on others. So he's a poster. Yeah, he's like a big political He goes back basically. to posting. And this is where Hamilton gets the award for being the first significant political figure in America to have a public sex scandal. Mm. Um... This actually started in 1791, but it doesn't become public until 1797. So after Hamilton's already stepped down from the treasury is when it actually breaks. But Hamilton starts sleeping with this woman, Mario Reynolds. Mario? He's dating, like, from the Mario and Luigi games? Mario. Mario. Yeah. Close. Not Mar- We're not in the Italy. Gender What's that? Bowsette. He's is it Bowsette? The gender Ben Mario. <laughs> yeah, just imagine. Oh no, she, she's just a... like normal ass looking Mario, but with titties. <laughs> <laughs> like that's all you gotta it's imagine. It's me, a Mario. Oh, no. It's <laughs> me. Um. So Mario approaches Hamilton with this whole sob story of you know how she needs money and her husband's abusive or whatever. And Hamilton gives her, you know, $30. And she's like, oh, how am I going to pay you back for this? He's like, yeah, I got an idea. <laughs> it's, he, he, let me guess. He fixes the cable. I knew you were going to say it. I, I mean, this. She, I guess if this is like female Mario, she is a plumber. Quickly, he has to pay blackmail money to her husband, is in another castle. who is aware of this affair going on, and is entirely possible that, like, they work together to orchestrate this whole thing. Hamilton eventually Wait, has to so pay. Wait, so he he suggests this, and she declines. Uh no, the Maria's husband contacts. No, I'm just I'm um, just James. wondering, did he get his dick sucked? It's like, how did that go down? Did he get the nookie or not? Like, what's the... We can assume... I mean, I don't have the explicit details, but yeah, like, they were definitely sleeping together. Sorry, that's all I wanted. I just wanted the dirt. I just wanted the deets. So James Reynolds, he, uh... He's Mario's husband, and he's getting a bunch of money from Hamilton um, to, you know, stay quiet about the whole thing and not release it to the public. Because, again, when this starts, Hamilton's the Secretary of the Treasury... 
Mm. So a total of over thirteen hundred dollars would ultimately be paid, um, which is basically like forty thousand dollars in today's money. But that's just adjusted for inflation. That's not even adjusting buying power. So it's a lot of money. Yeah, is the yeah, point. Yeah, you could get you could get like a pretty nice Porsche for that. You know, probably. So eventually, James Reynolds, uh, the husband, is arrested for counterfeiting and other crimes. And these payments by Hamilton are, you know, discovered as they're going through his stuff. And this leads to the belief that Hamilton might have been abusing his position as the Secretary of Treasury to, you know, pay this guy for some reason. Um, And Hamilton actually clears this up by telling the whole story to his counterparts in government. um, And that he was not, in fact, paying uh, James Reynolds with Treasury money, but instead was paying him, you know, out of his own pockets, I guess. Um, and so all the other guys in government actually agree to keep this a secret, um, because they're like, I guess you're not technically doing anything illegal, sort of. Um, because again, they were concerned that, like, Hamilton was, like, basically embezzling from the treasury or something. Um, was this in the musical? Was him getting his dick? Yes, this, this is in Uh the musical. Okay, all right, all right. So it's... now you want to watch the musical, right? I mean, is there a sex scene in it? <laughs> uh, no, but I mean, it, there's some there's some very sensual musical numbers in which they describe the sordidness. Not really. I've never been. I've never been less turned on in my entire life. <laughs> <laughs> God damn it! <laughs> a journalist <laughs> is investigating some you know, different stuff to, like, put together a history of the United States. And he finds some evidence, again, of these payments from Hamilton to Reynolds. And he starts up the speculation, again, Hamilton might have misappropriated treasury funds during his tenure. And again, now it's public knowledge because it's a journalist. So this leads Hamilton to publish the Reynolds pamphlet, a 100-page book, again, just published to the public, detailing the affair and explaining all of the money that was Hamilton's to give and that he was not abusing the treasury position, which now, is great. Now, can you still get this like, that's booklet his... for, like, a Kindle? Can I download this and read it still? I'm sure you could, yeah. Yeah, you can get it. You can totally get it. Nice. Yeah, you can get it in print. So, like, and, and like, so this detail, like, this was, like, the... This was like the grade school breakdown of like, you know, like we missionaried, we doggy styled, we <laughs> just had like all the... You'll see, I just, I just found it. I'm trying to like skim through it here. I would love, I would love trying to figure out all the innuendos from the time because they probably don't. And then I swifted her bucket with a right cherry polish. <laughs> I don't know if that's included in the text. I, but gar- I guarantee sure. there's like, and then her apples were thoroughly bounced upon my chiseled elbows. I'm trying to remember what it was, but in my in my uh, American literature class, I do remember reading something. It would like, it's very, it was very much like just yeah, like 1700s innuendo being written by American <laughs> historical figures. Uh, I can't remember which one it was, though. Um, anyway, so the 1800 presidential election comes around. I have one around. more question about this. Sure. Is sure. there an Alexander Hamilton porno available that's historically accurate based off of the outlines in this document? Because I feel like based off of the popularity... <laughs> <laughs> of the musical that there's a the, you could be there could be an untapped market here that we're overlooking and i don't want to like lose the forest for the trees here because if we can get together the right people yeah. maybe we can okay never mind so <laughs> i'm gonna say i'm reading this uh i'm reading this pamphlet right now he was a great writer Did, like totally. are there a lot it's of really hurricane good. are there but, a lot uh, of hurricane metaphors in his well, like love making descriptions. Is, uh, no, no, no. He's just. Uh, I haven't found any love making descriptions. I'm gonna stop Aww. reading it now. But he's a great writer. But holy shit, this does not need to be this long. Like so much of this is filler. This is like this is uh like watching that's one really, piece. That's right. Re- like half of it is just filler. 
I hate I hate reading like that's like every corporate email I've ever gotten where it's like two paragraphs long basically to say hey email me back would you have this what ready as per as my per last my email. last email so Hamilton's public life is now being viewed as you know a little sorted how did news, um, was there like a tabloid at the checkout line back then I mean there's like or... newspapers and stuff. Yeah, yeah, he releases the Reynolds paper, and then you got the newsboy on the corner. Extra, extra, Hamilton gets knob-rubbed. Yep, that's exactly right. I mean, technically speaking, uh, Hamilton actually, like, started um, the New York Post. And he couldn't couldn't have them run, like, a counter-op, be like, it's all fake, it's fake news, people. It's fake news. (laughs) Yeah, it worked really well. I mean, you know. Yeah. So we get around to the 1800s presidential election, and Hamilton is kind of in the business of making enemies, I guess, at this point. He actually is working against his own party's leader, the Federalists, John Adams. Um, so he's like basically like throwing the election, essentially, for the Democratic Republicans, even though that's not his party again. Um, and then. This, you know, again, he's, like, becoming just a little bit of a not good at making friends individual. Kind of like what we talked about last week. Um, then in 1801, Hamilton's eldest son, Philip, hears a man named George Ecker giving a speech in which he's making disparaging remarks about Hamilton, uh, specifically his politics, and basically saying that Hamilton would, like, want to lead an armed revolt against the presidency um and you know philip takes this as you know an insult against his father's honor and four months later philip has the chance to confront george ecker about it and a duel is ensued because you know they couldn't figure out how to actually come to an understanding so they just have to shoot each other uh and in the duel you know, philip it sounds is killed. crass but you know what have we lost in it <laughs> simpler times i'd probably run my mouth less if you could still challenge a motherfucker to a duel (laughs) true ever but if you go to a gun range everyone's really polite most of the time yeah (laughs) um hamilton actually has one more son after this who they also named philip in in his older brother's otter which i wonder how that is like being named after your like older sibling that's dead yeah, that's bad luck. My sister got my sister got on to me for doing that with a cat. Like that's kind of messed up for doing. I've heard I've heard of that happening a lot in like in like olden times, especially in like pi- pioneer families. will do that. They'll have a baby that dies as they're getting as they're homesteading, and then they just name the next baby whatever the first one was. Be like, this is this is that same baby. It just it just came out again. Take two. So, in 1804, following the election for governor for the state of New York, Aaron Burr, who is the sitting vice president of the United States at this time, loses the election uh, in large part due to Hamilton's influence. Furious and feeling his honor had been offended, uh, Burr demands Hamilton apologize, but Hamilton responds and says that he did not recall a specific offense that he had committed against Burr. Um, and this leads us to a duel. So, Hamilton and the sitting vice president of the United States uh-huh. face off with loaded pistols. As you um, do. So, Ham- Hamilton left a note the morning of the duel explaining his intention to throw away his shot. This is to just fire it up in the air. Um, and I guess, like, the hope is, like, it's kind of funny, like, you go through the whole process, like, you can't work it out with words, so then you're like, oh, we're going to do a duel, and then, like, technically speaking, this was a thing that could be done, just, like, you shoot, and I guess it's, I don't know if it's just, like, agreeing to disagree, like, we took it this far, but we don't actually want to mm. kill each other, yeah. um, but he, he felt this was the best option, as apparently he did not wish Burr dead, but he also felt that he could not back down from the duel, Um, Burr ends up actually, yeah, Burr ends up actually shooting Hamilton, and Hamilton dies the following afternoon. 
the duel took place very near the same location where his son had died. Oh, three so years he earlier. does. He wastes his. He wastes his shot. I say. Throws away his mm. shot. He's um, throwing away his shot. Thankfully, this would be the last time a sitting vice president of the United States shot someone. Wait, no. Um, wait, no. No, that's. I think that there was the one. No, I'm thinking of something else. Never mind. <laughs> the penis guy. <laughs> Uh, colon? No, that's not right. At least that guy. At least that guy technically lived. So I guess you know that's good. Use something Just besides the bird, bird shot. shot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that's the story of Alexander Hamilton. Uh, he was forty-nine years old or forty-seven because again oh, we damn. don't know. Um, and and uh, he yeah, he fucked around gets, quite a bit, this... and he found out quite a bit harder it seems yep and is he's shot dead by the vice president of the united states which i guess not many other people can say sir damn son and this was yeah. all about like losing a guy in election yeah so that's uh that's alexander hamilton thanks for bearing through this very long conversation no that was fine that was that one. was uh wow man I think you know. I I think you did. You probably did better than the musical would because I feel like I got a more in, intricate, a more nuanced look at this fucking libtard. This absolute goddamn tool. <laughs> oh my this gosh. piece of shit. No, we got almost. <laughs> we got almost two hours of footage well, this, here. You can um, trim. It's gonna you be can, a lot of editing. How, I was gonna say how much of that is content and how much of All that of is it. just. <laughs> Dylan and All I interrupting. I mean, that's it. content too, technically. You know, Absolutely. But yeah. I think that's a podcast. Thanks for tuning in to uh, Cacistocracy.